going on, everybody? Welcome into the Highlight, a business podcast for obviously the only, the most serious business people in the world. And today I'm bringing a new friend on the show to share the highlight. And, and obviously from us talking for five minutes, she's already the most serious person I've ever met. She never laughs. She never smiles. And uh, her name's Kirsty Goodlett. And she is the VP of Marketing at the Kettner Group. And I feel like that's way too many syllables for my South Georgia butt to be saying here on the uh, air. But here we are, Kirsty. Thanks for coming on the show. How are you Thank doing you today? Thank you for having me. I'm good. I'm really <laughs> glad to be here. It's a beautiful day in Atlanta, Georgia. The sun finally came out after a few days. Man, I'm jealous. So we're just south of Nashville, and it has just been raining nonstop. Mm -hmm. And I'm I, if we're mm -hmm. a day behind you guys in the weather front, then hopefully tomorrow is going to yeah. be nice and sunny. It's, I, hopefully something is coming for you. It's been raining here for a very long time as well. Yeah, we have one of those retention ponds in front of our house that has like an 80-year line on the top, and it's just been pegged <laughs> at that line for three days. And I'm like, well, that's oh nerve-wracking for my you know homeowner's uh -huh. insurance, but you yeah. know, we just, we're Good just luck. hoping and praying it holds on. <laughs> Well, I uh, I appreciate you jumping on the show and, and avoiding the nice weather outside to be locked inside with me. That's awesome. Uh, can you tell everybody a little bit about you and, and uh, your background? Sure. So um, as you said, I currently work for Kettner Group Communications. I was just promoted December 1st to VP of Marketing. I'm very excited about that. I have been with Kettner Group for about four years. And before this, I actually worked with Kettner Group in other ways. I uh, initially got to know them working in-house um, for a retail technology company uh, while they were our PR agency. And I worked for them as a contractor when I owned my own business. Um, these are good ways to get a sense of what I've done, which is um, kind of all over the place on the marketing and PR front, working both in-house, independently, um, and now for Kettner Group agent, like agency and um, supporting their marketing efforts as well as supporting the business overall, um, client relations, our HR and operations functions. Um, it's been fun to get to be a part of the business in general. Yeah, it's funny. I think as marketers, I think when you leave college and you want to be in the marketing career field, that means something in your head and then all of a sudden you get in it and you're like, oh, I got to know how to do all these different disciplines, including copywriting and uh, email and social media and marketing and PR and yeah. all the things. And I yeah, met... It's Go for it. Well, I was going to say for me, I actually studied film in college. And so I kind of really? fell into marketing and mm -hmm. didn't really know anything about it. And what excited me was exactly that, that there's so much to uncover and so much to get your hands around and get involved in that um, it's constantly interesting and engaging and offering up new challenges. Yeah, well, I didn't know that about you. I would imagine that the storytelling background has helped you be a better marketer, right? I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the fundamentals of storytelling um, are, you know, they're important for any format that you're, you're, you're telling stories in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Podcasts. Yeah, even yeah, podcasts, even in what we do for our clients from an ad standpoint, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll come to us and be like, hey, just tell them about the sale we have going on and, and, and call it a day. And I'm like, well, we can do that. But also if you wanted to be, you know, a cheaper CPM or maybe the ad gets higher click through rates or something like that, like maybe we could incorporate a little bit of a, a mini story in here, you know, even if it's mm -hmm. a, hey, are you struggling with X, Y, and Z? Like we can cool. solve that. Like that's a little bit better, you know what I mean? Versus uh -huh. just the generic uh, ad copy. I love stories. I've got several books behind me that I, I went way nice. too far down the road. I got into that Donald Miller story brand stuff. I don't know if you ever heard about that or read any of uh, that. I'm but... a little familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His big thing was basically taking, um, like Joseph Campbell's works. Who's mm -hmm. I'm going to get so nerdy for a second. This is so annoying. Joseph Campbell wrote a book called a hero with a thousand faces, which is like a breakdown of every story ever told. And he puts it in this circle and it's the monomyth and yada, yada, right? Nobody cares about that. But uh, Donald Miller came along and basically simplified that and made it a uh, framework that uh, small business owners specifically and marketers could use to help better connect their brands to um, potential clients, right? And I, and I think that's really a nice segue into what you guys do with the Kettner Group because you guys, you guys do a lot. I know all marketing agencies tend to do a bunch of different things. But the thing I saw and the reason why I reached out primarily was the public relations piece of it. And so mm -hmm. I'd love for you to unpack a little bit about what you guys do from a public relations sure. standpoint at, at the Kettner Group. And then let's mm -hmm. dive into it. 
Yeah. So Kettner Group is a communications agency. We are focused predominantly on public relations. Um, and then we, we move beyond that into other forms of marketing as it relates to the communications function. Mm-hmm. What I think sets us apart from other agencies is that we're wholly focused on working with retail technology companies. Mm-hmm. So if you were to go into your local coffee shop and buy a coffee, you probably, you know, maybe you have a iPad point of sale system that, you know, you're using to pay with with your card and maybe there's a Mm -hmm. subscription program involved in that and they send you a follow-up on your mobile device. All of that relationship building that's happening within the retail store, those are a bunch of different technologies working in the background and those are the types of folks who are our clients. I got to tell you, I'm having a little bit of PTSD right now. Uh, We've talked about it on the podcast a lot, but you probably don't know this about me. I used to own a barbecue restaurant. That was my first business. Like you, I was doing something else and then sort of graduated, I guess, into Mm -hmm. marketing. And yeah, we had a, we had a square POS system and we also had uh, chow now and uh, we Mm -hmm. had DoorDash. I mean, we had all that stuff six years ago and all sorts you could choose from toast. Yeah. Toast. Yep. Yeah. We had toast for a little while. Yeah. We Mm -hmm. had all of them and it was, uh, I think I heard about all of them via different, you know, marketing platform. Like it wasn't like us organically Googling any of that stuff. Like it was, Mm -hmm. it came up usually um, in a publication we were reading or something like that. So, mm-hmm. you know, this, uh, this podcast, we, we focus primarily on businesses between that, you know, one and $10 million in revenue range. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those guys, they tend to be founder led, you know, so the person that started the company has grown it to this level. And now they're for the first time ever having to sort of evolve their skill sets out beyond just the hustling grind of let's just survive mm-hmm. and grow and go as mm-hmm. fast as we can. So like, what would you tell somebody in that seat? Like, what do they need to know about PR? And I know that's probably a loaded question. Yeah. You can no, do a it's four a good, hour TED it's talk. It's a good one. But, yeah. um, I think the biggest thing to be aware of at, like, at that specific moment in the growth of the company is that PR may or may not be of service to you at that mm. moment. And it probably isn't. <laughs> mm, interesting. Um, there's a few reasons why. Um, there, in, in order to invest in PR, you have to have a story to tell. And if your story so far is I'm growing and we're figuring out what the business is, then uh, that's not quite the right opportunity to engage with media. Mm. If the story is we have been growing, we've been rolling out with these customers, here are successes we have found, here's ways that we're capturing new funding from VCs or private equity firms. Um, here are interesting things we're doing to evolve our product. Those are good opportunities to start engaging with journalists. So it's, it's more of a graduation of the story of the company. Um, that's when PR becomes really interesting as well. And I'm sure that you, you are very familiar with this piece of it. There's so many things that you can be doing with marketing. There are so many things that you can be doing with marketing. And when you're, when you're at that moment where you're primed for a lot of big growth, it's probably more likely that some of those initial foundational activities, like making sure your website is really sharp, maybe building out some initial awareness ads, um, creating a subscriber base for a newsletter that you can engage with for free on a regular basis. Those, those activities are most likely where you want to put effort first so that when you start Mm -hmm. doing PR, people come to your website after learning about you from an article um, or you have an executive who writes an article that's featured in an industry publication, um, then people see you in all sorts of different ways on through your digital presence and they're finding validation about your company. Um, so that's, that's where we see PR being interesting for, yeah. you know, founders or for that, that initial growth phase, um, it, uh, you know, you want to make sure you have a story to tell and that when you tell it, you have a platform that's ready for, to receive mm. inquiries. Yeah. Well, that's the old marketing adage, right? The, uh, the good marketing just will expose your bad product faster. So you want to make mm-hmm. sure you have your stuff together before you start telling people about it, like it, at a massive scale like that, because mm-hmm. Nothing worse than driving, you know, 10,000 people to your website and you don't have an email sign up form or something right. very or basic contact like forms that. down. <laughs> yeah. Or like your server for some reason is not even going to handle that no. much. It's a whole <laughs> thing. I, but what you did describe there that I think 
a a person that's either new to marketing or maybe sits in that founder seat and hasn't really mm-hmm. dove into the the skill set that is marketing is you're describing marketing mix perfectly. And you know, a marketing mix is like you have all these different tools in front of you from a marketer standpoint. You can you could buy a billboard, you could buy TV ads, you could you could hire a PR agency, you could run Facebook ads, you can do social media, you can build your own website. These are all different marketing functions and they're what we call the marketing mix, right? And and any healthy company is going to have a a wide range of marketing tools that they're using if they know where they're at in the business. But what we see a lot of times is that people are using them out of order. So I really like the suggestion that we wait to use this specific tool until, you know, we're at a certain scale that it's it's worth it to go to a larger more national audience. I will say that mm-hmm. when I had the barbecue restaurant, we were able to use like some local PR hacks. Cool. Um, yeah. You know, like we would we would, you know, uh, the, the example that always comes to my mind when I think about PR for a local business is uh, you know, just trying to get on the local news station with Yes, Super yes, Bowl it's, they're great. recipes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's like very hyper specific and it was only valuable to us because we were local and, you know, like a uh-huh. big company should never do that. It'd be a waste of time for them. But for us, <laughs> you know, we were a million dollar business. Like it was a great use yeah. of time. Yeah. I think that's you start to hit on something that's also really important to think about with PR, which is that um, you're requiring someone else to tell your story for you. And in order for that to happen, they're going to need to hear from you a number of times and you're going to need to build a relationship with them. So one thing that's a little bit unique about PR from other channels is that you need to have a consistent drumbeat of PR happening every month, every week. Um, so that you're creating. What do you mean by that? So, so for example, like tactically, um, like take your barbecue business. Um, it's going to be great to reach out to that local broadcast station, maybe once a year, but if you're only doing it once a year, are they going to remember you when you follow Mm -hmm. up? Is the journalist that you spoke with last still there? Mm -hmm. Have they moved on to another, um, network? Mm -hmm. If you're reaching out to them regularly, they're going to think about you when they're coming up with stories of the best holiday gifts. Um, you're going to know if someone moves and who their replacement is so that when they start thinking of new ways to tell stories, they're going to think of you and put you on the show. So that's, that's what I mean by that. You, you, you have to remember that PR is, is, is different because it's an exchange where the person on the other end, whether it's the publication or the editor or the reporter, they have something that they want to do, right? Like they want to tell an interesting story and you have fundamentals of that and you have something that you you want something of them, right? You want them to write about you instead of someone right. else. Yeah, um, exactly. So it's requiring this relationship between two people, which is very different than, you know, putting an ad on LinkedIn where you just need LinkedIn to take your money and make sure that you're following their guidelines in order for the ad to get posted. Yeah, yeah their LinkedIn's thing is, or any of those algorithm-based ad platforms, it's like, is your ad... We're, we're going to interrupt our feed of keeping people on the platform with this ad. And mm-hmm. so it better be worth it. And if it's not, then we're going to make it more expensive because you're going to kick people off our platform, which is how we make more money <laughs> down the road anyway. So there is still uh-huh. some, like back to what we talked about, like we try to get our customers to tell stories with their ads because it's more engaging and it, it's a better product. But I, but I love the, the win-win attitude behind there where you're, when you're thinking about it from a PR spec as a business, you're like, what does the reporter need? What are they, what is their right. actual objective here? It's like, I want to write an yes. engaging piece of content. I want to have an engaging segment on the news or whatever. Right. And it's great that you want to get on here and pitch your company or whatever. But if you're not able to engage people back to the storytelling element, then it's going to be hard to do. And I, I think a lot of people do approach those things with, with sort of selfish aspirations first versus thinking about what that person's need and, and putting their needs first. I, I, I don't know if that's always the case. Yeah, but I think that this is why there is sometimes easy. tension between PR professionals and reporters is because mm-hmm. of this, this exact, yeah. um, this exact challenge. But if you think about it from like, you know, we're both looking for the same thing, which is to tell interesting stories that help improve our business and ourselves as individuals, right? We have the same aim. Mm-hmm. Um, then that's where you get into interesting PR, where there's really an opportunity to develop relationships with reporters and also where you're able to think creatively about the stories that are going to resonate with your consumers that are interesting to them and that are relevant to the channel. So 
Um, if you think about PR, you know, that's about stories about the industry overall, which mm-hmm. is a different story than the one that you tell on your website, which is, yeah. you know, you as the consumer have probably these challenges that can get addressed with, you know, our company. Yeah. Well, that's how you end up getting tagged as a, um, as a contributor to an article, right? Like, Hey, can you provide me a quote here? Because th- that mm-hmm. reporter is going to go, what is my quickest way to, to write this article? Like, do I have somebody in this space already that I know that I can write? lean on for a quote here because I need something to like build this article out a little bit more. Right. Right. And reporters are strapped for time and they're writing a lot of articles and there's yeah. a lot that has to happen. So if you can help support their job and make it easy by talking to the story overall or the industry or offering up yourself as a resource, then mm. you help meet their their ultimate goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're, yeah, and you, they don't have to go use, uh, what is it, Hero? Is that the, that's the the big one, right? The mm-hmm. help a reporter. Yeah, we, you we, seen like, that? we like Hero. Yeah. Yes. Hero is a great tool. It's a great free tool. Um, and I would, I would really recommend using it. So it's just a simple little tool that you can sign up for. You put your email in and you get an alert every, every day, sometimes multiple times a day of reporters who are looking for stories and um, you can submit yourself or uh, your company or someone can submit the company on your behalf to help with those stories. Another platform that we use, which um, I think has a free model, but also a paid version is called Quoted, Q-W-O-T-E-D. Um, it's similar, except it's more built out into an overall you know, software platform, basically, um, yeah. to support uh, reporter inquiries and source Oh, that's cool. I didn't, I've never heard of that one. I, 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 yeah, we, we've dabbled one. with Hero, but never quoted. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I got to put yeah, that I on my list of, it. yeah. All right, man. See, I didn't want to come out of this interview with homework, but here we are. I got. Well, I got, it should, should be pretty easy. Sign up, see what you can find on there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I could just hire a PR firm to do this. It'd be much easier <laughs> for me. <laughs> with work. I got a podcast I'm trying to produce here, Kirsty. I'm not, you know, I can't be just you throwing out. more to your plate. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I want to go back to the building the relationship with the reporter. And you talked about frequently reaching out to that person just to like stay top of mind and continue to build the relationship. Is there, there's always a tension for me when I'm reaching out to that person that like, am I sending them the right thing or is it, um, am I going to burn my relationship with them out because I'm just sending them stuff all the time, even if I'm trying to make it valuable for them and I have good intentions, like, mm-hmm. but if it's like three months of sending stuff to them and they're not writing back to me, like, is there, I need to change the pitch. Like, how do I, build a better relationship with that reporter Mm -hmm. versus. Yeah. This is where things get tricky because every reporter is going to be totally different in regards to what they want and how often they want to be engaged with. Um, You know, one thing that you can try in order to have that question answered directly is to ask. I've been pitching you for three weeks, three months. I haven't heard back from you. I know that we talked a while ago and it seemed like we had a good relationship. I don't want Mm. to annoy you. (laughs) Yeah. Um, is there something I could be doing differently? Um, do you want to grab coffee and get to know each other a little bit better? Um, you know, alternatively, if you're not interested in being that direct, it is helpful to remember that PR professionals do the same thing and they don't hear back. And eventually maybe after a year of sending out regular engagement, it leads to something and maybe it doesn't. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it can be a little bit tricky to think about it because each person's going to be different in regards to what they're looking for. Mm. One so thing then, that I will I will yeah. offer that's that I like to think about and I find interesting regarding um, these pitches and a reporter's inbox is I think a lot of reporters use their inbox as a searching tool. So um, you know, if you think about you're working on a story and you want to you know we'll keep keep up with the barbecue company example. Mm-hmm. Um, you are doing a food story and you want to put in local products, you know, maybe you search, uh, Tennessee food Mm -hmm. and find a pitch from three months ago from the local barbecue company sharing recipes that incorporate barbecue sauce. Um, so what I, what I like about this is like the reminder that it's not always that a pitch leads to an opportunity, Sometimes there's the cadence of reaching out regularly helps eventually get somewhere, or sometimes reporters use their inbox as a search tool to, 
I did not expect a SEO search yeah. engine optimization. Yeah, that's uh, why pitch. the subject that's line a, is going to be important. The yeah. body, that initial you know piece that you have in the first piece, because people are going to use their inboxes like a, like a search tool. <laughs> that's I, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, uh, and I'm kind of blown away by how simple that is, but effective it would be because that's mm -hmm. exactly what that person would do in trying to ship a story as quickly as possible. That's right. still good. So, wow. Right. Okay. So add SEO in emails. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've got a, My to-do list is growing. You're killing happy me. To help. Is, I'm happy to help. Please stop. <laughs> please be worse at your job. That'd be great. Uh, you act like you're the VP of marketing for a PR firm. I mean, come on. So, well then, so we talk about building these relationships out and that's, that's a very time intensive thing. I mean, you're talking yes, about weekly emails, yes. weekly communication, and, and even if you're a smaller business owner, or even if you are a, a rep, a marketing rep at a, a larger company, you still only have so many working yes. hours in a week. How yes. do you determine which publications, platforms, news organizations, how do you determine which ones are the best ones for your organization that are worth pursuing those relationships with? Mm. Um, I mean, th this is where uh, we come back to the the first statement, which is, are are you ready for PR and do you want to invest in it? Right, because you are absolutely right. PR is is a function of time um, mm -hmm. in comparison to a function of of money or spend in order to generate results. Um, there are there is so much information out there for you to be able to use as your resource. And so it's a matter of sorting through it. Um, when it comes to figuring out the right publications, every publication will have subscriber information listed on their site. Um, sometimes they list it publicly under a certain landing page. Other times um, you can find subscriber information by downloading um, an ad, you know, portfolio or briefing book mm -hmm. or something, which will include subscriber information. Yeah. If it's not listed publicly, which would be a surprise, you can also reach out to an ad contact of the publication to get a sense of subscribers. The thing that is helpful to you there is ideally the subscriber base for the publication should match your tar target audience. So if your target audience is, um, you know, for us, uh, our companies want to reach retailers they often want to reach retail executives. Sometimes they want to reach um, the folks on the technology team. Other times they may want to reach folks on the, on the marketing team. Um, the subscriber information and the breakdown of those roles will help them identify, you know, is it a more of a marketing focused publication they should be aiming towards or more of a retail focused publication that also talks to marketing? Um so that's a, that's a really good place to start. Uh, I like to use social media as a good research tool to figure out um, a publication's reach on social, which can often be a good uh, validation of their reach in general. Mm -hmm. um, same with newsletter subscribers. Um, so those are those are good resources to figure it out. Again, what you're looking for is is my target audience going to be on mm -hmm. this publication? Yeah. Um, that is why so many folks that we work with, their main target are trade publications instead of larger top tier publications, because mm. there's a greater likelihood that their target audience is with those reading those trades. And, um, there's more of an opportunity for smaller companies or more niche companies or technology companies to appear in a trade publication than, you know, a larger top tier publication that's writing about large fortune 500 companies. Yeah. Do you guys have a thought about if, if PR is better for B2B companies or B2C companies? I think it can be helpful for both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I think PR does really successfully is help build validation. So, you know, if you go to a company's site and you see that they've been featured on these reputable publications, then yeah. you're going to think that they're reputable. Um, that's helpful for B2B and that's helpful for B2C. Um, yeah. It can also help with awareness, right? Like there's plenty of opportunities for B2B and for B2C where PR has generated leads and business because, mm -hmm. um, someone read about something in a publication that inspired them to get in touch with the company. 
Yeah. What uh, the, the social validation thing you just mentioned, we, we've seen it on a bunch of websites, right? Where it's like as featured on or as seen on Fox or CNN yes. or whatever. Yes. I got an ad the other day and I'd love to know what you think about this. I got an ad the other day from one of these companies that was like, if you give us 200 bucks, we can get you featured in all of these different platforms. And then you can ethically supposedly put as seen on <laughs> Fox and CNN and CNBC. And I was like, I'm not going to lie. I was like, hey, that's, you know, it seems like a really great shortcut to all my PR issues because otherwise I'm going to have to do what Kirsty said and get to work on like, you know, building relationships with certain reporters. And I'm just, you know, this seems faster and it only cost me 200 bucks, which is nothing. So <laughs> let's do it. We didn't do it, but we looked into it. And, I, and I'm just, you know, it, something felt weird about it because when we dug into it, it was like, they basically had referral partners with like, you know, the mm. local affiliate in Phoenix for CNN or Fox <laughs> or whatever. And then technically you'd be featured on their website in like one of these mass dump pages where they put oh, like a gosh. 120 character tweet about you out on the page uh -huh. basically. And I, and you know, technically I guess you could put you were featured, but that just feels <laughs> gross to me. I don't know. And maybe I'm just having a therapy session with you, but that's, I don't know. That was weird. It was, it was a weird experience. Yeah. Sure. That's, that's not a service that we offer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So <laughs> don't come to you for easy uh, $200 no. uh, publication. Yeah. No. Yeah, but it is fine. I mean, we see it all the time. The internet's a great thing that it's it's made things more accessible for people, but, you know, it's also yeah. made Yeah. No, we've certainly things. had this discussion before. The the thing about PR is that you can't guarantee you cannot guarantee placement. Yeah. Just... How do you handle that conversation with people? Like when they come to you and they're like, "I'm going to pay you this what seems like a crazy amount of money." And you're telling me I cannot be guaranteed results. Like, are yeah. you even a professional? Like, what oh. What are we doing here? Um, that is where one of the things that is is uh, is tricky comes in um, with client evaluation, right? Companies are going to be evaluating you as, as the agency. And mm. I'm sure that you have found this as a business owner, right? You're also evaluating them. And one of the things that we use as a marker because it helps guarantee long-term success is does the company understand the value of PR? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, entering a long-term engagement where you're working together monthly towards PR, which can be this slippery beast, yeah. mm -hmm. um, may not be destined for success. So um, there's certainly educating that is part of the conversation always and across mm -hmm. both parties when it comes to what is PR, where is it helpful, how does it play in the overall mix, how is the landscape changing? I mean, there was a huge changes to the landscape during COVID-19 right. as it related to journalist layoffs. Um, yeah. But we find that that's something that just kind of has to be part of the agreement when we start is like, do you... Do you understand where PR fits into your mix? Yeah. Do, are we on the same page about what that is? And if we're not, then it's probably not going to be a good long-term yeah. partnership. It, it's kind of a weird analogy, but it's like, this is the tool that you're using. And here's the thing that it's supposed to do, but there's no right. guarantee that it'll actually work, which is fascinating when you think about it. But it's, it's yeah. true. We always tell people that we work with, um, because we're like you guys, we, we tend to try to look for long-term relationships. And so we've turned people away that, just weren't good fits for us because even from a, a paid media standpoint, if you're going to run paid ads, like you may not need be in a place where you need to run paid ads. You might just need to go hire more salespeople to go door to door and cold call people right. because that's a right. faster ROI. Mm -hmm. um, but our underlying thesis from a marketing standpoint, and it seems like something you're hitting on as well is just marketing is about building long-term relationships. And um, if you're expecting it to drive financial results in a set period of time, that's not longer than you think it is. Uh, you're probably going to end up being disappointed by it. And it's it's funny that PR and public relations, it's a function under marketing. It is it, it holds true across the board because everything else is mm -hmm. a sales activity. Like I sent you a cold email to get right. you to buy something. I called you right. to get you to buy something. It wasn't to like read you an article on the phone and give you content. Like that is a totally different yes. activity. Yes, I think, that, I think that is absolutely right. You know, sales and marketing are different pieces of the puzzle that support one another. But right. ultimately marketing isn't about driving a specific sale. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I love the movement towards, uh, I think it's called demand generation now is like the hot buzzword that you see all over the internet is like, mm -hmm. can and we create demand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The demand generation people, yada, mm -hmm. yada. And it's like, okay, cool. We've just 
rebranded marketing is this new thing because <laughs> the other thing got so well, I don't know. bastardized I think about over it as time. Like demand gen is that part of the marketing function that is sitting closer to sales and is about that, you know, relationship with the sales, the Salesforce and Pardot tool mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. is about capturing the the bottom of the funnel conversions using an ad platform or whatever it yeah. is. That's funny. I see it as like a demand generation is just building the broad awareness with value added huh. content stuff. Well, this is a good example of a lead. new term. Yeah. <laughs> and then we don't even know. Yeah. And we're both marketing <laughs> professionals. <laughs> who knows what the thing means? Who knows? Who we can't even explain marketing. We should get some you should get someone on the podcast who has that job title. <laughs> I I would, I should, all right, I'm going to see, you keep giving me things to do after this. You act like I'm not busy. Like I've already got PR homework. Now I got marketing homework. It's Mm, a whole thing now. Podcast homework. Podcast. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean like this podcast is about, you know, this is what I see as demand generation. Maybe that's just more, you know, it's, it's a long-term play thing where we don't expect any sort of crazy results, but over time it gets people to know us and friends Mm -hmm. that we, we have in the industry. And it just, tends to work out in the long run. It's our own form yeah. of in-house PR. We try to own the mm-hmm. media when we can. Uh, yep. Some of our plans in 2023 and 24 is to to go externally and start leveraging other people's stuff as sales grow. But we're trying to do what you said and be really aware of where we are as an organization and say, is PR really the right move right now for us? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, not quite, but we're close, which is cool. frustrating because I just want to do everything. And I, you know, it, it yeah. kills me to say no to stuff, especially fun I stuff. I know. So. I know. I know. We have the same discussions when it comes to identifying the activities that we invest in from a marketing mm. perspective for the agency. Um, yeah. The list is selective. Yeah, it's tough. You got to know what to say no to because it everything has a cost. It's crazy. <laughs> All right. So we like to ask everybody this question. If I could 10x your budget for PR tomorrow, and let's say you were working at a, a business in that one to $10 million range, like we had talked about. And, you know, I'm assuming their budget for PR is probably zero. Like that's usually what it is, but like, let's say it was something. And then we've now made it where money's no longer a problem. Like what would you tell them to go do to, to more effectively use PR in 2023? Hire an agency to do it for them. Yeah. Why would you do because it's an, an exchange, agency versus Because it's, it's an exchange of time. Hmm. So you're yeah. spending the money to have someone else spend the time. Um, the benefit to hiring an agency to do it as opposed to doing it in-house, and this is something that's unique to that's PR, good. is that when you hire an agency, you should be vetting the agency for the existing relationships that they have with reporters. So you're paying yeah. them to have done all of the work to build all of those relationships over a long period of time, Yeah, which means that you can get results faster than if you start trying to build all of those in house. Yeah. And eventually recommend- maybe see someone in house who leaves for another company and takes all those relationships with them. Yeah, that's true. Then you're very vulnerable. <clears throat> uh, I like that. That's a good answer. Do you, do you have a, is it the marketing manager or somebody in the marketing team? That's the, the relationship holder between them and the agency? A hundred percent. Yes. That is yeah. another thing that we talk about a lot when it comes to identifying good client partnerships you really need to have someone in-house managing marketing who can manage the agency because yeah. the agency is going to create a lot of work for you if they're good. Yeah. Yeah. It's very and true. Um, reviewing a press release or fielding an interview question within half an hour if a journalist has a tight deadline is not mm-hmm. something an executive is probably going to have time available for. Um, yeah. And you want someone to be able to do that really efficiently and effectively. And your marketing person is going to know the story and be able to turn something around quickly and capture the message that's unique to the marketing function. That's different from that executive story Mm -hmm. or the sales story. Yeah, that's good. I I like that. A lot of times people will try to, uh, especially in this range of company we're talking about, they try to save money. I mean, fair enough. Like cash flow is a problem. I get it, but they try to, bring it all in house or they try to do it all themselves. And it's, you just, you get worse results and it takes longer to get the worst results. And so yeah, outsourcing it as quickly as possible makes a lot of sense. I I like that answer. That's good. Cool. Uh, So I got to know, did you watch the new, um, it's on Apple TV, so maybe not. It's kind of a weird platform, but the Ryan Reynolds movie with Will Ferrell, the new Christmas movie that just came out. No, Uh, no, I haven't. 
So fun fact, Ryan Reynolds is a PR person. So your homework coming out of this episode is to go watch Great. that movie. I'm, I would be more than happy to. <laughs> just text me afterwards and tell me what you think about Ryan Reynolds as a PR exec because it's crazy. <laughs> I spoiler alert because it's only like the first ten minutes of the movie, but he is a he's speaking at a uh, Christmas tree conference, Christmas uh -huh. tree farmer conference in okay. Canada or something, mm -hmm. and he basically he tells them to orchestrate a fight between people that use real trees and people that use fake trees, and he's like giving them PR advice and like there's this whole social media campaign. <laughs> And a war starts between people that uh, use real trees versus people that use fake trees, and it's mm. it's all the brilliance that is Ryan Reynolds. But it was uh, I don't <laughs> know that was that was crazy. Uh, but you got to check it out. More than happy to. All right. So last question of the day here: If uh, you just moved to Atlanta, we were talking about that a little mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, what has been either the best part of living there so far, or what are you looking forward to the most? Uh, the best part so far is that I get to live in a city that's like really a, an urban environment. So I live in a house, but I'm a block from a coffee shop and I'm a block from a market and I'm oh, a block still from walkable. restaurants and I can walk to a public park and yeah. there's a Marta station a half mile from me and a Target 10 minutes away and a huge airport. Like it's just, it's really cool to be part of a a city for all that that entails but to get the benefit of living in a house with a backyard that's amazing and it sounds like you got enough things close to where you don't have to get tangled mm -hmm. up in that atlanta traffic too bad and uh... no no <laughs> i will try to keep my circle as small as possible that's good well you know you and i were talking offline a little bit we got to get you to be a braves fan you know we're trying to grow the tribe a yeah little bit. my father and i used to go to braves games when i was a kid and he stopped taking us when he realized we were there for the hot dogs <laughs> it's bad pr <laughs> he's, he's, he's got to get it he's got to get the messaging right you know he's got to so he's, he's gotta work on this. it didn't really stick i wear a braves hat <laughs> that's great hey, that's enough that's all i need i don't need like real fans i'm just we're going for mass numbers here okay i don't need you to know who yeah, the backup third sure. baseman is this is it yeah we're fine well, uh, Kirstie, I appreciate you jumping on the phone with me today and, and doing this podcast and even doing the video version because I know that was uh, that was unexpected <laughs> twist. So I, I like good. to uh, keep you on your toes and uh, we'll make sure to link you up. Is there anything else you want to go over before we let you let you go? No, this has been really, really fun. I love yeah. getting to have conversations about marketing and PR and how to help businesses. So well, this thank is you great. for well, having I'm... me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to go do my homework and, you know, we're going to execute on it for six months and then we'll have you back on. Great. And I'll get, you tell I, me what I, you found. I'll, yeah, I'll have to get a grade. And I'm going to be like, hey, look, your advice was great or it, it, I did it wrong because obviously it's good advice, but I just well, didn't Well, I don't know. So. I'm happy to hear if it didn't turn out for you. <laughs> <laughs> I should be telling people something else. Maybe. I don't, uh, no, I'm sure you're, you, this is great. If it doesn't work, it's on me. I 100% will say that. <laughs> Well, we appreciate you coming on. We appreciate everybody listening, and we will see you next week.